You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 25. Well, welcome back. I'm Gavin Weber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Well, I've got a very interesting topic this week, and I'm going to be talking about pasteurisation. Now, pasteurisation was used mainly in the wine and beer industry, would you believe? It didn't actually come across to milk until the early uh, 20th century. It was invented by quite a few different people, but they uh, hadn't quite figured out how to keep the taste and the flavour of the product that they were pasteurising. And uh, before we move on, pasteurisation, what is it? Well, what it is, it's heating a liquid or foodstuff to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time to kill pathogens that may be naturally present within that product. For instance, uh, milk. (laughs) Milk has a lot of uh, bacterial uh, activity in it, and it's an excellent medium for growing microbes. So when stored at normal room temperature, milk can sour quite quickly. And you've probably noticed that if you've ever managed to get your hands on some raw milk, you will find that within a day or two, maybe three, the and it hasn't been refrigerated, the milk sours naturally. And that's because it has the right enzymes in, in the milk to do that, and it acidifies. Now, this is where pasteurization comes in. It, it's a... It's for two reasons. One, the primary reason is to kill pathogens so they don't proliferate. Uh, And the other one is to increase its shelf life. Its shelf life at normal refrigeration temperatures of around 4 degrees Celsius. So 4 degrees Celsius is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I just checked my notes there. So... What are some of the diseases that can hang around in in milk? I said they're an excellent medium for growing microbes. Well, some of the uh, the world's uh, most dangerous food outbreaks have occurred in uh, raw milk uh, when it hasn't been handled properly at the milking um, at the milk processing plant, or the cow's dirty, or the cow's diseased, or whatever have you. So some of the uh, some of the diseases that pasteurisation can present are things like tuberculosis, uh, diphtheria, scarlet fever, and they also kill bacteria such as salmonella, listeria, um, staphylococcus aurelius, and E. coli. So these are some of the bacteria that they can that the pasteurisation process can uh, destroy. Now, let's talk about methods of pasteurization, whether you think it's a good idea or bad. Uh, It has enabled humans to um, stop getting sick uh, from uh, improperly, shall I say, improperly handled milk. If people handle their milk and they drink it within a very short time of it coming from the cow or the goat, then there's not going to be that many problems. However, if you do not know the origin of the milk, Um, and it hasn't been pasteurised, then I would recommend, uh, and it is is illegal to sell raw milk by law um, at the farm gate without being pasteurised. So let's talk about some pasteurisation methods. So the first method is what's commonly known as the home pasteurisation method. And basically what you do is you get your raw milk, you put it into a stainless steel pot, or a glass pot, never use aluminium because it taints the milk, and you place that pot into another or use a double boiler method, very similar to what I do in my cheese making videos, and you put that on the stove top and you heat the milk up to 60 degrees Celsius, uh, which is the same as 145 Fahrenheit. And you stir that occasionally to make sure that it's evenly heated. Now you hold it at that temperature at, a, at 60 degrees Celsius, for exactly 30 minutes and this is crucial the time has to be spot on so too little time and it won't kill all the bacteria too much time it starts to destroy the the enzymes in the milk that you're going to need for um, for cheese making so don't heat it too long or too short 30 minutes on the knocker at 145 fahrenheit 60 degrees celsius 
and this also helps to prevent the the calcium from becoming insoluble where you would have to add in calcium chloride. So using this home pasteurization method is spot on for cheese making. So after the 30 minutes, you must cool the pot of milk down as quickly as you can down to 4 degrees Celsius or 40 Fahrenheit. So you can do that into a sink of ice water and that'll rapidly cool it down. Uh, and this is very important because this el eliminates the conditions that the bacteria need to multiply um, as it's cooling down through what's known as the danger zone, which just happens to be the same temperature as human's blood. <laughs> the danger zone is between 30 and I think about 35 degrees Celsius. So you've got to rapidly go past that so that bacteria does not multiply. So then you can store that into the, uh, into the fridge or you can heat it back up again and make cheese out of it straight away. Now that's the very that's the safe method. That's the method that you will get the best curd set. Um, so that's called the home pasteurization method. Now there's another method that uh, factories use, and this is called the flash pasteurization method. Flash pasteurization is basically uh, the milk is heated up to uh, 72 degrees Celsius, which is 101 Fahrenheit, for 15 seconds. So I'll say that again, flash pasteurization, the milk is heated up to 76 degrees Celsius or 161 Fahrenheit for 15 seconds and that destroys the pathogenic bacteria as well. Uh, then it's rapidly cooled down to um, 4 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Look, that's not too bad. That sort of pasteurized milk is, uh, is okay. Uh, you will maybe and depends on the milk, you'll need to add calcium chloride uh, to that to make a, a decent curd set. I've found that uh, the milk I've been using here in Victoria, it's a, it's a brand called Jonesy's Milk. It's made in, um, in country Victoria. I haven't had to use calcium chloride to, to make the curd set. The pasteurisation, they're using flash pasteurisation. Uh, it's not too bad. I don't have any problems. The curd's nice and firm. In fact, it's the best curd I've had for the more the milk that I've been able to buy uh, around here in my parts anyway. Which leads me on to the next type of pasteurisation. The next type of pasteurisation is called ultra-pasteurisation. Now this, as we all know, milk is a living thing. I've just mentioned that, that it has bacteria living in it, good and bad, uh, and the pasteurisation or or using the home pasteurization method, kills most of the bad bacteria, certainly culls their numbers down so it doesn't make you sick. However, manufacturers have always want to you know, be able to supply you milk that has a long shelf life. And that way they can oversupply the market and it doesn't go off. So um, I don't particularly like ultra-pasteurization uh, because basically you can't make uh, milk from it very well. Uh, and the only way you're going to know is by looking on the carton, uh, if you buy it in a carton uh, from a normal supermarket or grocery store. Now what they do is that they uh, heat the milk to 191 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is 88 degrees Celsius, for at least one second. And this kills all of the organisms within the milk. Uh, it also gives the milk a slightly cooked taste. Uh, a bit like that of uh, evaporated milk. So the, the main purpose of this sort of treatment is, sure, it kills the bacteria, but it, what, it, what it promotes is a very long shelf life. So ultra-pasteurised uh, milk and cream will last for at least 21 days as long as they're refrigerated and not opened. So that's n nearly twice as long as normal conventional flash pasteurisation. It's less than ideal for home cheese making because the protein structure is damaged and as I mentioned, all the enzymes are, dest are destroyed. So it has no real advantage. You really couldn't call it milk because it's no longer alive. It's a sterile product. You've killed all of the enzymes in it. Most of the questions that I get here on the Little Green Cheese podcast are to do with being able to set a firm curd. They say that they're People write into me and they, they uh, voicemail me and 
So I can't get my curd to set. The biggest issue is that manufacturers do not label their milk as ultra pasteurized. And if they or if they do, the people who buy it don't expect uh, this type of milk to um, to not work for cheese making. That's a double negative. If that makes sense. Um, so ultra pasteurization is a way for people to have a longer shelf life so supermarkets can keep it there longer. Um, but uh, just make sure that if you're going to use milk for cheese making, that you use either get raw milk and pasteurize it yourself using the home pasteurization method, method uh, which is the 60 Celsius or 145 Fahrenheit uh, to 30 minutes and then cool it down rapidly to 4 degrees Celsius or 40 Fahrenheit or that you buy it and it is uh, flash pasteurized uh, and it'll say just pasteurized on the on the container so that's ultra pasteurization so if you thought that was bad there's one last type of treatment for milk that totally well it makes it not milk as far as I'm concerned and this is called ultra heat treated. It's different than ultra ultra pasteurized. So this is UHT milk or long life milk, and it's sold in foil lined containers. So tetra packs, basically, and those square tetra packs that are uh, they have a coating of aluminium foil in them. Now the milk is tortured. Um, it is basically flash heated at a temperature of. 135 Celsius, which is uh, 275 Fahrenheit, uh, to 140, uh, 148 Celsius, which is 300 Fahrenheit. Uh, and this is uh, heated at this temperature for less than one second. So this totally destroys everything in the milk. It destroys the soluble calcium, all of the enzymes that make milk taste like milk. Uh, and the only thing you can do with this milk is make a soft cheese. It makes a a very average ricotta. You cannot make cheese out of ultra heat treated or UHT milk. So if you can get your hands on some raw product and pasteurize it, or if you prefer to make raw milk cheese, then uh, the Australian standards mention that you can, if you make uh, cheeses, hard cheeses like Romano and uh, Parmesan uh, that uh, do process at a uh, sorry age at a long time and uh, at a low temperature there are uh, recommendations within the Australian food standards uh, for making milk with raw sorry making cheese with uh, raw milk um, but the best thing to do is if you can get it from a cow then uh, simply pasteurize it doesn't take much trouble and uh, then make your cheese and uh, and you won't get caught with any of those nasties if you make any mistakes with your a sanitization of the equipment so better be safe than sorry and uh, pasteurize your raw milk now while i was doing research for this episode i happened to uh, stumble across a, a goat's milk dairy in nimbin in new south wales and i can't back it up with any uh, factual evidence but uh, the nimbin dairy uh, who sells only um, goat's milk mentioned on their site that uh, because goat's milk has less pathogens than normal dairy cattle like uh, cows and buffalo that they're allowed to sell raw milk now i can't find out whether that's uh, factual or not uh, you know the rule of the internet believe uh, two-fifths of bugger all that you um that you you read on it um so Basically, um, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Go and check out the Nimbin Valley Dairy, and uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about there. Uh, and if there, if anybody knows of a rule for uh, goat's milk uh, that it can be sold raw at the uh, at the dairy gate, then uh, please let me know either via comment or send me an email at uh, gavin at littlegreencheese.com, and I'll be happy to pop that up into a blog post or up into the next episode. Right, well, that's all I've got for the uh, part topic of pasteurisation. I hope that has enlightened uh, some of you out there why they pasteurise and and why what the, the simple method is um, behind pasteurisation. Well, 
has been uh, a lot of cheese news this week, or this fortnight. Uh, and mainly it's coming out of the US and it's around um, a ruling, it's over a ruling over whether wooden boards are safe to use when ageing and storing cheese. This is, uh, this is a ruling by the Food and Drug Administration out of the United States. So it had sent through a ruling through to um, somebody who asked for some uh, a cheese making operation. Uh, and it was found that uh, actually within the the FDA rules, it actually mentions that you must be able to prevent bacteria from growing on medium that the cheese is aging on. It, it doesn't um, it doesn't actually prohibit uh, wooden shelving, uh, and it doesn't uh, ban the use of uh, of wooden shelving for for aging your cheese. But um, there was this in this clarification of this ruling. There certainly was. So cheesemakers, artisan cheesemakers throughout the US. Uh, certainly were up in arms that uh, that they certainly wouldn't be able to make cheese because most of the flavour when it's ageing comes from uh, whatever uh, bacteria that are trapped within and, and moulds that are trapped within the the wood that the cheese ages on. You know, all the, the artists and cheese makers that I know, probably one or two, <laughs> they they sterilise their wood first, so they steam heat their the wood uh, and that kills any pathogens. Uh, they let it dry and then they put the um, the cheese on the wooden racks and they, they age it. So, yeah, like I said, there's a lot of hullabaloo. I will put a link in the show notes to this news article um, that I found. It's, it's titled FDA Issues Clarification, but Cheesemakers Are Wary. Um, it's out of the uh, food, sorry, the dining and wine section of the New York Times. So I'll pop that in there and you can have a read for yourself. Uh, on what do you think of this? Is it a storm in a teacup or is it the FDA trying to push their weight around for the use of um, big commercial factories that uh, that age theirs on um, stainless steel wire racks or uh, plastic shelving? Yeah, let me know. Um, that'd be interesting to uh, find out from some readers if they had the same sort of um, same sort of reaction to the news that the FDA were going to ban wooden shelving for artisan cheese aging. So um, now it's time for listener questions. So I've got quite a few here uh, because I've decided to incorporate the questions that are on my YouTube channel. Uh, the YouTube channel is Greening of Gavin. You just have to look for that. Uh, do a quick search in YouTube and you'll see the 30 odd um, cheese making video tutorials that I've made free of charge. Uh, you just pop over there and have a look at those. Now, the first one, yeah, let me have a look here. Uh, this is Pachanon Patch Panthini. Sorry about that if I've butchered your name. It says, G'day Gavin, just wondering, can I use fresh dairy cow milk from my farm, brackets raw milk, for any type of cheese? Thanks, mate. Well, as I just mentioned in the uh, just fortuitous that I've been talking about pasteurisation, yes, you can use uh, fresh milk from your cow, um, it's up to you, it's your risk. If you think your cleanliness is up to scratch and the cow hasn't got any diseases and, and yada, 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 then um, yeah, go ahead and use raw milk. Uh, don't take that as a professional recommendation for me. However, if you pasteurise your milk, um, just like the process that I mentioned just previously, then you won't have too many problems with that. Okay, uh, the next one is from... Angelo, and Angelo says, uh, your voice is hypnotic. Thank you. You're in my control, Angelo. Uh, superb cheese videos. I use a two Johnson controller, temperature controller, model A419, one for my slow cooker and one for the fridge. But how do you maintain a high relative humidity? Doesn't the dehumidifier of the fridge defeat the purpose of trying to maintain a high humidity? Well, I don't think so, Angelo. The um, the way to keep high humidity in a, a free refrigerator or a wine fridge, it's pretty simple. There's a couple of ways. You can get a humidifier, of course, and that pumps around uh, mystified. Um, it's not steam. It's it's just water at a lower temperature, and it increases the humidity up to about 90, 90% relative humidity. What I do is I get an ice cream container, a 4-litre ice cream container, a 1-gallon ice cream container, and I fill that with water, 
uh, and I put a big sponge in it to increase the surface area. And this keeps the relative humidity of the cheese fridge at around 80 to 85%, which is fine for cheeses if you're maturing them in, in wax. Uh, and it keeps the cheese moist, it doesn't crack, um, and it works very well. Now, if I'm going to use mold ripened cheeses, then I keep them in a sealed container, just a long Tupperware container. Uh, this has a, a raised bottom, so it's got an insert you put, you can raise the bottom. So I can do my camemberts or stiltons or, or mini bries or what have you in that container. Underneath the stand, the little plastic stand that the cheeses sit on, I just put a little... Um, a little uh, ceramic bowl, it's just got a little bit of water in it. Uh, sometimes I find I don't need to put that in there. And by sealing the lid and keeping that in the cheese fridge at the right temperature, then I can keep humidity at around 90 to 95%. And that is perfect for ripening um, mould ripened cheeses. So Angelo, I hope that answers your question. Uh, the next one is from Janet. Uh, and Janet says... I tried my first camembert this last week, but my back bedroom was at 14 degrees Celsius, where I left it for a week now, and they'll have them outside in a chili bin uh, at 10 degrees Celsius. At day 12, with a small amount of white mould, it tastes very salty and strong. Shall I continue to throw it out? Oh, sorry. Shall I continue or throw it out and start again? Thanks for the useful video. Well, Janet, I think that you should... If it's starting to smell pretty strong, it's probably no good. You have aged it at uh, a temperature that's far too high. Uh, seven degrees Celsius is what you need to age it at for the first couple of weeks before you wrap them in um, the cheese paper. Uh, and then you can uh, then you can um, keep them at seven degrees if you wish or go down to four degrees and they will still uh, grow and mature in the middle. You shouldn't really keep your cheese um, at above four degrees Celsius for any longer than four weeks. Uh, that's for your mould ripened cheese, uh, like camembert, which you mentioned. It probably has a very strong ammonia smell, so I, I would throw it away. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, keep your cheese at a lower temperature when you're doing that. Okay, so that's it for the uh, YouTube questions. I'll just move on. Uh, we have some other ones here. So this one is from... Uh, Terry and Terry says greetings from the USA I have just seen your marvelous video regarding the Parmesan cheese and have a quick uh, couple of questions uh, you mentioned sterilizing your plastic container with vinegar uh, which is what you use to brine the cheese can you tell me the acidity percentage of the vinegar that you use for that the acidity content of our vinegars differs from various brands and might be either much too lower or higher than those across the ponds uh, it's a big pond. Um, also, do you sometimes sterilise your hands as well or just hop hot soap and water? That would be hot water and soap. Uh, I consider today's accidental discovery of your efforts and expertise a treasure of information. Thank you for all the, uh, that effort and especially thank you in advance for your response. Regards, Terry. Well, thanks very much, Terry, for your email. The... Acidity in the vinegar that I use, it's normal white distilled vinegar and it has an acidity of about 6%, uh, 6% acidic acid and that is, that is just normal off the shelf, a shelf uh, brand. And yes, I, um, there, I know that I realise that there are many other different types of um, vinegars that have higher or lower acidities, but uh, that's the, the acidity for white distilled vinegar so when I do um, wash my hands I wash my hands with the uh, hot water and soap um, soap that I actually make myself uh, and then I do spray my hands with just white distilled vinegar and that I find that gets rid of any molds that are lurking um, on my in the folds of my skin in the uh, you know the uh, what do they call it the fingerprint thing the ripples in your skin yes that make everybody individual so uh, I just do that and make sure that anything that I cannot sterilize, that I'll either use a weak bleach solution, and that's uh, uh, 20 mils of bleach to 2 litres of water. Uh, so that's not very much, just weak bleach, and then I wash that off with cold water, and that kills any bacteria. 
or I use um, a vinegar and that gets rid of any moulds and any uh, bacteria that may be lurking on your equipment or uh, on your hands for that matter. So hopefully that's answered your question, Terry. Okay, the next question is from, this one is from Kelvin and Kelvin writes, Gavin, I am a new curd nerd with only two cheeses under my belt, feta and mozzarella. Today I'm about to make a farmhouse cheddar. I live in Queensland and my local supplier of cheese making supplies and advice is Green Living Australia. Uh, your site was recommended to me from a fellow cheesemaker I met at work. Well, thanks for the recommendation. Uh, my question is in regards to the temperature of the cheese fridge. The books I have from Green Living Australia say 10 degrees, but the little I have picked up from your site on fridges shows 13 degrees. Uh, that's in Celsius. The cheese fridge I have is a wine fridge with a compressor, not thermoelectric cooling technology like you originally had. I can't wait to read, uh, to have a comprehensive read of all the information on your site. Regards, Kelvin. Well, thanks, Kelvin, for your email. I recommend, highly recommend, that you set your cheese fridge. If you're going to do semi-hard cheeses, and it differs from recipe to recipe, but the best rule of thumb is 13 degrees Celsius for uh, cheddars and semi-hard cheeses, and hard cheeses for that matter, for Parmesan and Romano. So, uh, yeah, 13 degrees Celsius is, is the desired temperature, and you'll see in a lot of the cheese-making books, mine included, that 13 is the temperature to set it at. Now, if you're going to make mould-ripened cheeses, then, yeah, 10 degrees is pretty good, 7 is better, uh, and that uh, slows the mould uh, ripening down and gets rid of those, any ammonia flavour, especially if you're using geotrichum um, penicillin or um, a penicillium candidum, which is the white coating on the mould ripened cheeses. So yeah, set it at 13, but like I said, it, it depends on recipe to recipe. So when you're making a new cheese, just check that out and have a look. Okay, the next one is a, it's a testimonial, I think in the last podcast I answered his question. This is from Michael. Michael says, thanks for the tip on the farmhouse pepper blue. Uh, I'll try that next time. Well, I cracked my Stilton today. It's been in the cave for four months. The smell was amazing, just like being in a cheese shop. The blue vein was present, although I would have liked more, and you can clearly see the points where I pierced the cheese. The taste, fantastic, lovely, strong blue flavour. The texture was crumbly, smooth and creamy. I have to agree with your last podcast that it's similar to the Roaring Forties, which is made by King Island Dairies, um, and it is one of his, one of Michael's favourite blue cheeses. Anyway, thanks for all the podcasts, ebooks, video tutorials, and other helpful information you supply. I am truly hooked on making cheese now. Regards, Michael. Lovely. Thank you very much, Michael, for your email. And he sent through some fantastic pictures of the Stilton that he made. Uh, it's got that lovely wrinkly texture on the outside with the mould. And you can see um, from the half that there are some uh, blue vein lines that have gone all the way through. Not as many as he liked, but that's about it's about the same as what I get. Um, I put a, as many holes as I possibly can in it to get as much um, uh, of the uh, penicillium rogue 40 growing through it. But it, I think he's done a very good job. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one or two of these photos up on uh, with the show notes. And that'll be fantastic. And you'll see uh, Michael's wonderful creation. Okay, uh, one last question. This one is around... Uh, this is about feta. This one's from Adrian. And Adrian writes, Hi Gavin, thanks for the great content that you've developed for home cheese making. I've made the 30 minute mozzarella, halloumi and feta now, which all went pretty well for a newbie. I'm trying out a few soft cheeses prior to embarking on semi-hard cheeses soon, I hope. I have a question about feta, the feta I made. It has a great flavour, but it is quite soft, too soft to cut up to marinate in oil. I used non-homogenized milk and followed your recipe from the ebooks closely without any issues. Do you have any ideas on what I could do differently next time to firm up the cheese a little bit? I was thinking maybe stirring after cutting the curd for a bit longer to allow more whey to come out of the curd before putting into the moulds. Or would pressing for a little bit longer make a difference? Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Regards, Adrian. Well, thanks, Adrian, for your email. Fantastic. 
um, that you have jumped on the Curd Nerd bandwagon. <laughs> it's great fun. I really do enjoy it as a hobby. It sounds like you do too. Now, to answer your questions about feta, now I find that the feta does go soggy if you haven't set up your brine properly. And I think that might be what the issue is. Remember you brine the feta for, or you store it in brine. Now what can happen is if you only use a salt and it's not a fully saturated brine, uh, you will need to add a teaspoon of vinegar and about three to five millilitres of uh, calcium chloride. And what that stops is the... Uh, calcium in the cheese leaching into the brine solution when it is uh, salting the feta. So you will need to add that. There is a, um, I have done a very comprehensive post on Little Green Cheese that includes the proper method for making a brine for home cheese makers. And uh, you can go and have a look at that. I'll pop that in the show notes and, um, and you can click on the link and go through and have a look at the proper way to make a brine so it doesn't uh, go all sloppy before you can do anything with it. It firms up the feta very well and you can store it for a long time. I've stored feta up to six months in brine like that in the back of the fridge, forgotten about it, pulled it out, and it tastes absolutely fantastic. The longer you age feta in brine, the better it tastes. It really does taste delicious. But remember, you have to add not only the salt to make the brine, but a little bit of vinegar and some calcium chloride and that'll stop the calcium from the cheese leaching into the brine, and you won't have it all sloppy and soft. And you'll be able to cut it and do anything you like with it. You'll be able to marinate it in oil, but make sure when you do marinate feta in oil that you store it in the fridge. If you're going to use olive oil, put a little bit of, probably not a little bit, 50% sunflower oil, 50% olive oil, and that way when you put it into the fridge to store it, it doesn't go cloudy because olive oil, when you take it down to four degrees Celsius, clouds up. Well, that's certainly my experience. So if you're going to marinate feta in olive oil, then uh, make sure it's 50-50 sunflower oil and uh, the other 50% olive oil. And then you put your herbs in and your spices and all that sort of yummy stuff that'll impart a bit of flavour into the cheese. Anyway, that's all I've got time for this week. Um, I've rambled on for quite a while. Hopefully you've enjoyed the episode and you learned a little bit about pasteurisation and the hullabaloo that the FDA stirred up about um, artisan cheesemakers ageing their cheese on wooden boards. And um, thanks for the questions, everybody, and keep them coming in. I didn't have any uh, voicemail questions from SpeakPipe this week. Um, so um, if you want to ask any questions, pop over to littlegreencheese.com and there is a widget on the right-hand side uh, or in, within some of the show notes and it says leave Gavin a message. So just leave me a voice message. Most home PCs these days have a microphone. Just uh, if, if you do though, please, I ask you <laughs> if you can have a listen to your voicemail before you hit the send button. Uh, just make sure it doesn't have too much ambient background noise because sometimes it's pretty hard to understand the questions. But I want to make it nice and clear so people can hear it on the podcast. But anyway, I, I, I really appreciate anybody taking the time to do any of those voicemail questions. But uh, keep the questions coming in. It doesn't matter how many times I've heard it before. Um, people out there, all the listeners who listen to the Cheese Making Podcast have not heard them. Even if you think it's just crazy from left field, don't worry, ask the question and you'll get a decent answer. And if I don't know it or haven't experienced it, I'll go and do some research um, and let everybody know. And this builds up the community, the podcasting community. So upcoming workshop dates, uh, they're all over at Little Green Cheese. You can also find my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese. The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home, and that's available in all ebook formats and at all good ebook store retailers. You can also find my um, cheese making video tutorials. Just pop over to YouTube, look for the username Greening of Gavin, and you will find there's about 30 home cheese making video tutorials, and uh, you can enjoy all those. They're all free, which is fantastic. 
So don't forget that you can pop over to iTunes and you can rate this podcast, um, give it a rating and a review. I'll be greatly appreciative. Um, it moves the podcast up in the charts and more and more people will learn about uh, home cheese making at home. So thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, the news theme, and called the Dairy Cows.